There's something almost instinctual about it. Bare feet on bark, fingers hooked around a branch, heart pounding as you pull yourself higher. For children, climbing trees is an unspoken rite of passage, a moment of freedom and fearlessness. But step back and ask a deeper question. When did we stop doing it? Not just as individuals, but as a species. When did humans descend from the trees for good? And why? This is the story of how we went from tree dwelling to upright walkers, from the forest canopy to the open savanna, from four limbs to two. And while the trees may be behind us, echoes of our arboreal past still shape who we are today, in body, in instinct, and in the activities we return to when the world gets too flat. But to understand when we stopped climbing, we first need to understand why we climbed in the first place. To understand when we stopped climbing, we have to start with why we climbed in the first place. The earliest primates were small, tree-dwelling mammals that lived roughly 60 million years ago. Life in the trees required agility, balance, and precision. Their hands evolved to grasp branches with opposable thumbs and sensitive fingertips. Their eyes moved to the front of the face, providing depth perception for judging distance between branches. Limbs became flexible, shoulder joints mobile, and tails long for balance. These traits are part of what make a primate a primate. And this is the basis of the arboreal theory, a foundational idea in evolutionary biology. It argues that many of the traits that distinguish primates, including humans, originated as adaptations for life in the trees. Our distant ancestors weren't just capable climbers, they were built for it. Their survival depended on it. This arboreal lifestyle shaped the very foundation of our physical and neurological development. Climbing required not only strength and coordination, but spatial awareness, memory, and problem-solving capacities that became the groundwork for our evolving intelligence. But eventually, something changed. The forest thinned, the ground opened up, and with it came new challenges and new adaptations. So what changed? Around five to seven million years ago, the Earth's climate began to shift. Forests in East Africa started to thin, replaced by more open woodlands and savanna. This change in habitat pushed some primates to adapt. Among them were our earliest human ancestors. Fossil evidence from species like Artipithecus ramidus, dating back 4.4 million years, shows a creature that could walk upright, but also had adaptations for climbing, like a grasping big toe and flexible hips. Australopithecus afarensis, best known from the famous Lucy skeleton, lived around 3.2 million years ago and showed further progress towards bipedalism but still retained long arms and curved fingers. This period marks a transitional phase where climbing remained essential, but was no longer the only way to move through the world. The savanna hypothesis suggests that upright walking became advantageous in open grasslands, allowing individuals to see over tall grass, travel longer distances efficiently, and carry food, tools, or infants. Walking freed the hands, and over generations, that freedom changed everything. Still, the shift from tree dweller to upright walker wasn't immediate. For a long time, we lived in both worlds. Our ancestors didn't flip a switch from climbing to walking. For millions of years, they did both. This period of dual locomotion gave early hominins a strategic edge. They could move more quickly across the ground, but also retreat to the trees for safety, sleep, or foraging. Australopithecus species had long arms relative to their legs, strong shoulder joints, and curved fingers ideal for gripping branches but their pelvic structure and leg bones showed increasing efficiency in upright walking. This adaptability likely allowed our ancestors to thrive in changing and fragmented landscapes. Climbing remained a vital part of survival, whether to escape predators, access food, or build sleeping nests. Even Homo habilis, who lived around 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago, is often credited as the first toolmaker, retained climbing features. But over time, natural selection favored traits that made bipedalism more effective. Hands became more dexterous. Feet became arched and rigid for efficient walking. The spine and pelvis shifted to better support upright posture. And yet, traces of our tree climbing ancestry still linger in surprising places, even in the present day. In some modern human populations, the ability to climb is not just preserved, it thrives. The Batek people of Malaysia, for example, regularly climb tall trees to harvest honey using techniques passed down for generations. Their feet are surprisingly adept to grip, and their climbing is smooth, fluid, and efficient. In the Congo Basin, 
The Twa and other forest-dwelling hunter-gatherers scale trees barefoot to gather fruit and hunt. Their daily life still includes the kinds of physical challenges our ancestors faced for millions of years. Studies have shown that some of these groups retain ankle flexibility and toe articulation rarely seen in industrialized societies. In fact, trained tree climbers, even in the modern world, can activate climbing movements that closely resemble those of early hominins. And while most of us no longer climb for survival, a growing number now do it by choice. In recent decades, climbing has undergone a global transformation. What was once a niche activity is now a thriving subculture, complete with documentaries, festivals, gear brands, and a deeply connected international community. Indoor climbing gyms have brought the vertical world to cities, making climbing accessible to people of all ages and backgrounds. Outdoor destinations have grown into global gathering places for adventurers and athletes alike. In 2021, climbing even made its Olympic debut, a modern twist on an ancient instinct. Whether it's a barefoot ascent for honey or a chalk-covered grip on a brightly colored hold, climbing is no longer just a survival skill. It's a shared language, a movement, and for many, a way of life. So what does climbing mean to us now, in a world of cities, screens, and elevators? In the modern era, climbing has re-emerged, not as a necessity, but as a form of expression, challenge, and even meditation. Today, climbers engage with rock faces, urban structures, and gym walls not to survive, but to test themselves, to focus, and to feel fully present. Climbing isn't just physical, it's cognitive. It demands decision-making under stress, body awareness, balance, and improvisation. Some research believe it activates ancient neural circuits, deep structures shaped by millions of years of life in the trees. The result is a mental state often described as meditative or flow-like, even among beginners. For children, this connection is often immediate. Before they're taught fear, they climb without hesitation. Trees become forts, rocket ships, thrones. That urge isn't learned, it's inherited. And for many adults, climbing becomes a way to tap back into that intuition. Because maybe the real question isn't just when we stop climbing trees, but why we still crave the climb, even when we don't have to. So when did we stop climbing trees? There was no sudden break, but rather a gradual shift that unfolded over millions of years. From full-time tree dwellers to part-time climbers, from versatile foragers to ground-dwelling runners, we adapted to a changing world. But the trees never entirely left us. Climbing remains embedded in our biology, our behavior, and our imaginations. It's in the muscles that we still know how to pull, in the hands that still grasp, and the thrill that rises when we lift ourselves off the ground. We may no longer live in the trees, but something in us remembers how. And every time we climb, whether it's a tree, a cliff, or a playground wall, we remember too.